What's going on, guys? Welcome to the podcast. Have the biggest guest that I've ever had on this one, so I'm super pumped. Literally hit him up about a week ago, and uh, he said, "Yeah, let's do it." And he actually lives in my in my area as well. But we got Sam Prim here, otherwise known as Sam Faster Freedom, big real estate guy. I can't I can't wait to ask him some questions. But uh, welcome, man. Let everybody know who you are if they don't know who you are already. Yeah, no, I appreciate being on here. I've seen some of your podcasts, and I'm like, I, one of these days, I'm going to sit across from Kyle and awkwardly stare into his face, and and we're going to do some <laughs> we're going to do some podcasts together. So, no, yeah, like you said, I'm big into real estate. Do some social media stuff as well, and just try to provide as much value I can wherever I go. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get into all of it, but yeah, big into real estate. Big into social media and uh, looking to help uh, provide some value for your audience, my man. Awesome, man. Awesome, man. So, so I remember. I don't remember what you did when you before the the real estate transition. Mm-hmm. So, get into that job and and kind of what you were doing and what made you want to pivot into to real estate. Yeah, so I was doing what most people do and what I was told to do, and you were probably told to do is go to college, get a job work at that job, invest in an IRA, 401k, get promoted, retire at 65, bada boom, bada bang, you're done. So that was the path I was on. My dad was an engineer, mom a part-time uh, teacher. So that's I didn't have any aspirations besides that. So come college time, me and my buddy Lucas, uh, who's local here, you should have him on here as well. He, uh, Him and I started doing some how, or doing some painting of houses in the summers. You know, We were painting houses in the summers of college, You know, going out drinking, having fun, occasional bar fight here and there, and you can paint with a, with a black eye pretty easily, right? So we were, we were doing that and having fun, and that kind of started an, uh, kind of an entrepreneurial itch for me. You know, I was like, this is fun, works for myself. I'd playing competitive sports growing up, and there's that, you know, keeping score, and when that kind of goes away, and you're in college, so then the painting business kind of took that over, and then when I got into the quote-unquote real world, it was just kind of a, not a bummer, but it was, you know, I had done well in my job and got promoted, but I just felt like a little emptiness, and just like not driven, not being pushed, and all that, so then we started to invest in real estate on the side. We bought, started to buy some rentals with the Burrs method, and then started to, you know, stack that wholesale flip, and that was 2014, and by 2018, uh, quit the job, went full time into real estate, and then really uh, put the pedal to the metal. And now we have 40, 48 employees and uh, about forty seven million dollars worth of real estate now. And uh, you know, rentals and flip about three hundred houses a year. So we're all in now. We can break all that down. So just kind of wanted to get the ball rolling to super normal upbringing, right? Like I didn't grow up in an entrepreneurial household, didn't inherit any money from my parents. What did your parents do for a living? Not really that smart. And I was able to do this. Uh, My dad was an engineer. My mom was a teacher part-time. So like nothing. No, my dad's like a super like, you know, sit in the same box every single day, engineer type personalities. So. Okay. Yeah. I kind of grew up the same, the same exact way. Very, uh, my mom's a nurse. My, my dad is, uh, like, um, an electrician construction okay. worker. Mm-hmm. So when I was like, Hey, I want to start a business. They weren't like, yeah, you should go do that. They were like, no, you should not do that. Yep. But, uh, so, so you had this job, right. And you were already investing into real estate. What, what was that job? So I was, uh, uh started out in sales selling Caterpillar construction equipment. So I graduated college in May of 2011, made $17,000 that year, um, you know, selling Caterpillar construction equipment. And then I started to do better and got promoted. And um, I was a sales manager by the time I quit. So just, you know, the yellow big equipment you see on the side of the road, that's what that's what I was selling. And you were, were you taking all of that money, investing it into real estate at the time? No, none of none of it. Never. So I, I, I say this a lot and it's true. I have literally spent zero dollars of my own money to get to $46, $47 million worth of real estate just by properly and responsibly leveraging, which I'm sure we'll get into. But no, I've always, always borrowed my way to to creating buying assets and doing whatever. OPM. OPM uh, all day. Yeah. So uh what what how did you learn about real estate, you know, to go acquire your rentals and wholesaling and that sort of thing? Did you hire any mentors along the way? Not at first. I wish I probably would have. So it's pretty cliche, but uh, Lucas actually sent me, and I'll probably reference him a few times. He's my business partner and all this stuff, but he sent me Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I read it on my honeymoon and, you know, got married in 2000, summer of 2012, or I guess that's when the honeymoon was, probably 2013, I guess. So, but anyways, read the read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, kind of opened my mind a little bit just to the potential of assets and equity and cash flow and what it does for most people that read it. So then we started poking around and looking at like, hey, let's start to buy rentals. Let's replace our income with rental properties. Lucas wanted to quit his job. I really didn't. So our goal wasn't to ever grow and have 50 employees or now 1,000 employees as our goal. Now, that was never our goal. My goal was just to start to get into something new, 
get that competitive itch, that entrepreneurial itch we talked about earlier. So we just started looking around and poking at properties and trying to get one here or there. And we wanted to buy rentals. And I thought you needed to put 20% down cash to buy a rental property. And we didn't have 20% cash member. I made 17 grand just a couple years before. So I was like, I knew you could borrow money to buy a, a flip. I had watched Flipper Flop and HGTV shows where they go to the rich buddy, they buy the house with their money, then they split the profit. So I knew you could do that. And I was like, well, let's do that. So we started asking around and finally got one of my dad's friends after about six months of poking and prodding to give us a hundred thousand dollar loan so we bought a property for 77 grand put about 15 16 thousand into it a lot of sweat equity ourselves and the plan was to sell it take what profit we had left after paying him back and put that down on a property but then we learned about the uh the burrs method and refinancing and everything so then we ended up refining out of that and we still own it today so not really a ton of guidance. We just kind of hopped in and figured it out a as we went. And, you know, I wish we would have had a little more guidance because we were pretty inefficient at first, but we learned a lot as well. So with my junk removal business that I had out here, you know, we would acquire leads all the time for people wanting to sell their homes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I watch your content. I watch other people's content. And I was like, I got to buy some, some flips. I wasn't really interested in rentals at the okay. time. It was wholesales and flips. And I came across this one deal and I was like, oh, this, this is a deal. So I said I could buy their home. And I made an offer on the home and they were like, let's go ahead and do it. Right. So I met, I met up with them. I had them sign the contract and I think it was, uh, it was $167,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was like, where am I going to come up with this money? Mm -hmm. So I went to one of my relatives and I said, Hey, I'll split this deal with you 50, 50. I'll do all the work. You're just going to sit back. Right. And he put it under his LLC and then from there, he he basically 100% funded. So the deal plus the the rehab cost, we ended up making $67,000 profit on that deal. I got paid 33, he got paid 33, and we've done multiple deals since then. But I also learned that there was probably better ways that I could have did that than structuring it the the 50-50. So, um, so you keep on mentoring, me mentioning the, the Burr method. What is the Burr method? So it stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and scale. It's basically a way to buy rental properties through creative financing, through creating equity and rehabbing, and not having to put 20% down. Most people think that you have to put 20% down in cash for a bank to finance your property over 25 or 30 years. That's not the case. Banks don't give a shit. I don't know if I can cuss on here. Yeah, banks, you can. <laughs> banks don't give a shit about your cash. They really don't. All they want is 20% minimum equity. If you bring them a deal that you have $80,000 in that's worth $100,000, they will give you an $80,000 loan. Now, if it's worth $100,000 and you and you don't have any money in it, then they'll make you bring $20,000 to the table. So basically, it's a creative way to get 20% equity. So I'll just quickly break it down if that's cool. So it stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and scale. So let's do some simple math. So you buy a distressed property for $50,000 and then you rehab it and put $25,000 into it. So you have 75 grand total in the deal. Now you can borrow that 75 grand from a, um, a, my dad's friend or from a relative like you did. You can borrow money to buy it and fix it up. So you have 75 grand of a private lender's money in the deal. It's worth 100 though, because you bought it at a discount because it was distressed. You repaired it. It's rent ready. So now you get it rented. You take it to a bank and they'll do what I just said. They'll, they'll do an appraisal and they'll say, we'll give you a loan for 80% of this appraised value. That property is worth 100. They give you a loan for 80 grand. It's a check. It's a cashier's check. I know that because I threw away cashier's check before. It's like throwing away cash. Don't do that. It's not like throwing away a normal check. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, they'll give you a loan for 80 grand. You pay back your lender. They're 75 grand plus, let's say, five grand in interest in this case. And now you own a rental property that's worth 100000 that you owe the bank $80,000 and you owe them that over 25 years at 7% now, whatever it is, and your rent pays the bank every single month. So it's not like super sexy because you're not going to be making 500 bucks a month cash flow on it. You're going to be making 180 bucks a month cash flow. But guess what? That $100,000 house is going to be worth 200000 in 15 years, minimum. Real estate doubles in value every 15 years without exception. I've done a ton of research on it, especially rental priced assets. They double in value every 15 years. You bought a house in 2006 at the height, guess what? It was doubled by 2021. You bought it in 1960, it was doubled by 1975. So it's like a fact. So that's the cool part is though that house is worth 100 now. It's going to be worth 200 grand in 15 years and the debt's going to be paid down by somebody else. And then now you have 150 grand in equity 
and then you can do that as many times as you want. There is zero limit to how many times you can do it. I've done it almost 300 times. So that's where it gets exciting with that longer term play. So it's just a way to scale because very few people make enough money to put 20% down consistently to buy enough assets to actually create that wealth. So you mentioned the word debt a lot, you know, <laughs> I do, and yes. I grew up thinking don't have debt whatsoever. You know, you you kind of like flex, hey, here's how much debt I have in a way, right? And it probably works out tremendous. <laughs> it does, yes. <laughs> That's probably why you have so many followers and why Dave Ramsey called you out, which I, I'll bring that up later. Okay, yeah. But um, so you mentioned that the word debt, why, like, there's obviously a difference between good debt and bad debt. And even me, I was like, well, I want to purchase all these properties cash. Why should somebody want to acquire debt on, on these properties to be able to, to scale? Yeah, so it's not what we're taught. So that's why it's so hard for people. It's ingrained in them through whatever reasons. People have conspiracy theories and whatever the reason is, but we're taught to fear debt, exactly like you said. Uh, Dave Ramsey is a big, a big proponent of that, of, of fearing debt. But it's just when you peel back the onion a little bit, it's the way the world works. Like simple examples. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, he started and grew Facebook through debt. He borrowed money from Peter Thiel gave him some um, ownership. So that's a little bit wonky of an example, but that's how the world works. That's what Elon Musk did with Tesla. That's what Bezos did with Amazon. That's what everybody does to start businesses. The world is reigned on debt and credit, not on cash. So if I can borrow money that's not mine to buy an asset that produces cash and take the cash that asset produces to pay off who I borrowed the money from, it's like kind of like a hack and it's a little confusing so we can break it down, but it's really not in, in simple terms. You're borrowing money, to buy an asset, that asset produces cash, you take the cash that asset produces and you pay off who you borrowed the money from and you own that asset. And equity and assets is what creates wealth. So this can be done with businesses, duplexes, apartment complexes, um, commercial buildings, you know, NFL stadiums, like that's how the world works. Nobody that has money pays cash for anything. They use their equity, they use their cachet, they use their cash to leverage and borrow money. So it's just a different way of thinking. You said there's bad consumer debt for sure. If you're buying something that doesn't produce cash and it's not going to grow in value, then yeah, that's bad. But if you're buying an asset, then it's how you do it. Like there's no other way to say it. Nobody just like snaps their fingers and becomes a millionaire. They do it usually through debt. And there's a lot of tax advantages as well, yes. what I learned. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm good buddies with Austin Rutherford. Okay, and yeah. I went to him like a couple months ago and I was like, hey, man, what do you think about me going to put, you know, we'll say a hundred grand down and I'm, I'm just going to buy a house and I'm going to start buying them cash. And then whenever interest rates are uh, better, you know, I'll go ahead and uh, refinance those. And he was like, you're an idiot. Here's the, here's the, the tax advantage that you're going to get. Why don't you go buy four of those properties? And the, the tax advantage is going to be way better. And for a guy like myself, who I should be more focused on getting rentals and stuff like that. I'm more focused on earned income. And then I get hit with a massive tax bill, which starting next year, I'm I'm going to work on getting that tax bill down to make sure that I uh, hopefully don't owe as much money or any money whatsoever. So are you buying a lot of real estate as well for you know tax advantages? That yeah, sort of thing? that's a big thing. Yeah. So we actually just finished our taxes for 2022. Um, and I got a new CPA, a new accounting firm that does our books that's a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more taking depreciation and taking advantage of what's out there and cost seg and things like that. So I'd been paying taxes the last couple of years, quarterly and things like that, and um, did pretty well for myself last year, and I'm getting $100,000 back because that's... of what I had paid before. So it is insane. I never thought I would make as much money like in a 10-year period as I made last year, and I'm paying $0 in taxes on it. So yes, there's huge tax benefits. Because the IRS, the government, everybody, the Fed, everybody understands the backbone of the entire economy is real estate, whether it's investing or, or whether it's residential, the entire backbone of it. That's why that saying is if the U.S. real estate market um, sneezes, the rest of the world gets a cold kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's the backbone of everything between people having equity in their houses and refinancing and taking out HELOCs to spend money on things, to go on vacation, to spur the economy, to investing. So they understand that. So that's why there are so many laws and taxes and loopholes written in there to incentivize you to invest in real estate. So just take what's out there. Everybody tries to reinvent the wheel, right? Just take what's out there. 90% of millionaires are created through real estate. So creatively figure out how to buy freaking real estate and it'll all work out. It's amazing, man. So tell me a little bit more about, you know, Faster House. A lot of people who are local to our area. They, they've all heard of Faster House and Faster House meetings. I know uh, you're linked up with them in some way. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so Fast Trail. So it's a local uh, We Buy Houses company in St. Louis. Uh, I mentioned earlier Lucas. So me and Lucas own Faster House. Uh, I own 50%. He owns 50%. So we buy about 250, 300 houses a year. We have a team of 24. That's our biggest company. We have a team of 24 there. And yeah, that's what we do. We go out and we find distressed properties and we buy them and keep them as rentals or we buy them and sell them to somebody else to keep as rentals. Like if you're looking to buy rentals, we sell rentals to people all the time that need work and you can do the burn method and use none of your money, all that fun stuff stuff. But yeah, we are in the market. We've done over a thousand houses in the past few years. And yeah, we buy them, we fix them up, we sell them, we wholesale them, or we keep them as rentals. And it's just a really good lead source for a rental portfolio, as well as it's fun to have a team. You know, there's, I bet like seven or eight people on that team that own more than 10 rentals. So people like our entire team is, is building their wealth and you're off to a way better start than I am. How old are you? 23. Yeah, you're 23, you nutsack. All right, so you're 23. So you're like, when I was 23, I was literally just got done in my bar fight stage. Right. So you're crushing me. So if you like start to, you're going to start your next phase is going to be like building a team you probably already have, but that's where it gets fun, man. We have almost 50 employees. Our goal is to have a thousand teams, like helping them build their wealth. And, and these re these properties that Fast Trials brings in are a great resource for everybody on the team, as well as the community to build their own wealth. So it's a it's a different style company. It's a little more risk adverse. The margins are a little bit lower, but are a little more risky. Uh, the margins are a little bit lower, but it's, it's a fun business. And we buy distressed houses and, and you know, we're like, we buy the houses comp competition, I guess, for those that don't know it. So did you work for this company or be mentored by this company and then ended up buying into it or? Yeah. So that's a great story. So, um, Brian Schroeder, who's local and anybody in St. Louis knows about him. So he approached Lucas and I in 2017 about, uh, partnering with him. Like he owned hundred percent of it at the time. He's like, I'll, I'll give you guys a third ownership each and I'll take a third if you come in here and like run the show. Cause Lucas and I, at that point, we're probably doing 20 flips a year. So we were kind of competition, not really. They were probably doing 100 houses a year, 120 houses a year. Maybe we were doing 20 to 30. So they were bigger than us, but similar. And he's like, let's kind of join forces. And, and that's what we did. And he kind of veered his attention into growing his lending company, uh, his hard money lending company. And Luke's and I kind of took over that faster house. And then we started Faster Freedom. And then uh, came a point where like, we're just different points in our life. Brian's in his mid 50, done really well for himself, kind of wanted to like a little bit slower of a lifestyle and not grow. And Luke's and I are like, we're just getting started. Like right mm -hmm. now, I feel like I'm just getting started. Like haven't scratched the surface. I'll look back in five years and be like, you were an idiot. And well, I do that anyway. But um, I'll look back tomorrow and say that. But we were in different phases. So yeah, we ended up buying, buying Brian out of his third share of Faster House. And now it's just Luke's and I. So it's just, Brian's incredible, great mentor as a businessman, great mentor overall, incredible human being, but at just different points in our lives. So does he still handle the the lending side or are you guys a part of that as well? No, so the lending side. So yeah, that that's the one that he kind of kept in his corner is that lending side. So he okay. does he does the local hard money lending. Um I have actually a national hard money lender as part of my as part of my community, but the local stuff I out of respect to him, I, I leave alone. I don't do any 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 lending here in St. Louis. So so faster freedom, is that the educational side of mm -hmm. things? Yep. Tell tell me a little bit about that. So faster freedom. So you are just, I feel like you're like literally like a, a year or two behind my journey. Cause how, how old is your education company? Uh, about a year. Oh, so mine's about two and a half years, three yeah. years. So about three years ago, um, I guess at this time it was 2019. I started posting on my personal Facebook page. Just, we had bought an apartment complex. I remember in Troy, Missouri, a 12 unit. We were just walking the property and like just Lucas or I post on our personal pages about it. And I had like, at the time it was crazy. Like 30 or 40 DMs from like high school, college buddies and people like, what are you doing? How are you doing? I was like, wow, this is interesting. This many people are interested in what we're doing. Cause I just thought it was like normal. They're like, how are you doing it? And asking a ton of questions. Then I poked around and I saw like gurus that had done like three deals or four deals and like created this course and we're selling and making all this money. And I'm like, bro, I've done it a hundred times and you've mm -hmm. done it three times. You wrote a book about it and are selling a course about it. So that kind of piqued my interest is I would like to, I feel like I should be teaching this and not you. So then 2020 hit, COVID hit. And that summer is when I started, I made a TikTok account in like July or August of 2020. And then I did that to try to grow YouTube because I didn't know that TikTok was going to have 1.9 million followers. I didn't know any of that stuff was going to happen. So I just started posting on TikTok to grow my YouTube. And that kind of started to gain momentum. And then I think you're taught, we were talking earlier about your impressive numbers. I think in 2020, we started like to sell like a course and do things. I think we made about 40 grand. 
So yay for me, right? Um, so it was started off slow. I didn't know the deliverable was growing social media in the background, trying to create this brand. Then 2021, started to get more traction on social media, figure out the brand, figure out the deliverables and figure out like what type of community I wanted to build. And then it's just kind of blossomed from there. I, I only, um, you know, talk about buying rentals right now. We tried to do a ton of different things. So right now, I, my sole focus, my sole skew is, is helping people buy rentals like I do with none of my own money. But it's done really well. We have 1,400 students, as we mentioned earlier, that own over 200 million in real estate. So a lot of huge, huge wins. There's one guy that just quit his job as a teacher. He, he bought 40 rentals in his first year and he just quit his job as a teacher. Um, and you know, the school hired him back to, as a consultant to teach them how to buy real, real estate. So anyways, he's over in Kansas, but a lot of really cool stories and a lot of really cool wins seeing the impact of, you know, doing things the right way. That's amazing. So for me, the way that I started my uh, mm -hmm. coaching business is I saw these people, right. That were already in the industry. And I saw how much money was probably in the industry, but I was extremely focused on creating a hundred million dollar junk removal company. I, that, that. I was laser focused on that. Right. And I, I invested into Austin Rutherford's masterminds and stuff like that, where I became friends with them. And that's where I was asking, Hey, you post five times a day on social media. I post one time a year. What, how do you, how do you do that? I don't understand. Right. <laughs> And so then after I left there, that was like the pivoting moment for me where I was like, I'm going to build a personal brand. Love it. So I started building a personal brand. And uh, after a few months, I had a few, I had one video that had 175,000 views, which was like nuts to me at the time. And I probably had a few hundred, if not a thousand or more DMs and emails. And they were all saying, hey, will you show me how to start a junk removal company? And I was like, man... There's a there's a lot of potential you know deals on the line here, and also a lot of people are interested in this. So it wasn't like I was really trying to get into the industry; it just fell in my lap. Mm -hmm. So that week, I I basically just kind of put the junk removal business on the back burners. It was already running on itself, anyways. And I took calls throughout that whole entire week. Never heard a funnel in my life. I never I didn't know how to like nurture leads or anything like that. Hopped on the phones with these people. And they were like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And I was just seeing if it was if it was going to work. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what we do. I, I, you know, I show people how to start and scale a junk removal business. And uh, I didn't have a product to sell. I was just going to see if it if it was going to work mm -hmm. before I went out and did it. And I ended up collecting twenty seven thousand that first week. Let's go with a hundred percent profit margins. And people were flying out to my office and they were going to ride on my trucks and we were going to do this training thing, what I told them that we were, that I was going to offer. And then I had somebody flying out in 48 hours and I said, well, shit, I got to quit calling all these leads. I got to go make something. So then I made that, right? And then I asked that person how I can make it better. And then it ended up growing to, to something big. So... Uh, it's really, it's really cool that, you know, you're, you're coaching 1400 people. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, no, it's, it's been really fun. And, um, again, I feel like I'm just getting started with that. So building community, I'm sure you've done a really good job, especially if you're able to sell because, you know, selling their, whoever's buying you, whoever bought you and whoever buys those companies, they just want um, processes in place and revenue. They don't even care if it's a paperclip or if it's a junk removal business, as long as, you know, as you know, by selling your company. So um, building that community is huge. And I just went to a mastermind, uh, which you should probably look into, but um, it's called the Family Mastermind. Um, like it's got some pretty big hitters and like Pace Morby. So I got to meet him and Jamil and a lot of those guys in the real estate space and the community that they've built and how they've done it is insane. So I used to think that, uh, and I still do think that my mentorship community community was like the best in the country. I still think it's up there, but man, we have a lot of growth to do. So I think that's something that um, I have noticed. If you feel like you get to a certain point and you enter a new room, you're all, you're the bottom person in the room. And then you enter a new room to become the bottom person in the room. If you're willing to, and I don't know why I'm going on this tangent, but if you're willing to continue to upgrade who you're around and become the lowest person in the room, you're going to continue to grow because you've already done it a few times, probably at 23, you knucklehead, but mm -hmm. um, you become like the biggest person in the room. And then that's cool. And everybody looks up to you and yeah, your ego stroked and the vanity's there and awesome, but then you're, you're kind of become stagnant. So it's the easiest, to, it's easy to stay there. Yeah. Too. It's super easy because it's comfortable and that's fine for some people, but I want to, and will become a billionaire and I want to own a billion dollars in real estate. And I want to bring an NBA team to St. Louis. I'm not going to do that just sitting on my butt and being the biggest person in every room I'm in. That's not going to happen. 
So you started posting on social media, mm-hmm. right? I know that one um, that one apartment complex that you bought, you you posted about it. You got your first initial traction there, mm-hmm. right? But what was like the first video or you know on social media that really like changed the game for you? Yeah, so I was on uh, on posting on TikTok at the time. My my YouTube still sucks. I'm much better at short form. I've realized, but I was posting on YouTube, not really Instagram. I wish I'd start Instagram sooner. Like. All this, the the 2.7 million followers I've gotten, 2.65 million of them have been probably the last year and a half, almost two years. So I got a slow start. But I remember like my eighth or ninth video on TikTok. I said, TikTok, this is a dancing app. You watch booties clap here. Like this isn't an app for real estate. Cause, and then my buddy now Kong, I saw him do a video. They got like 200,000 views. I was like, holy shit, 200,000 views. So I was like, all right, I'll post on TikTok once a day for 30 days. And if it doesn't catch, I'm gone. I'm moving on to something else. Going to try to grow my YouTube and maybe figure out Twitter, or LinkedIn, whatever it was at the time that I was looking to do. And I think it was my eighth or ninth video got like 150,000 views. I was like, are you serious? Like you said that one you got, like that's an insane amount still. But especially back then, you're like, holy crap. So I was sitting there and I was, um, I remember it was a video. I was standing outside of our old office. And I swear it was on accident, but there's a G-Wagon behind me. I did like up the street. So that kind of got people's attention. I just, it was like 18 second video. I pointed to the beat like I do now a lot. And I just talked about, I, um, this is how you create financial freedom using none of your own money. And then it was just like a quick little buy house, borrowing somebody's money, rehab of somebody's money, um, get it rented, refinance at the bank, pay them back. Boom. You only, something like that it was like an 18 second quick video. And it got like 180,000 views in like two days. So that got me like hooked on that potential. So, yeah. And the G wagon, was that in the video? It was. Okay. okay. And like I said, I probably, it was like, it was behind me, like behind the tree. It was, it was noticeable, but I just went outside cause lighting was good. Somebody held the phone and I pointed to the beat with the sound up super loud. And, uh, I'm not like a huge car guy like Mr. Lambo over here. I have a $75,000 truck. I mean, it's a lightning, but it's not super expensive. And, uh, yeah, it was back there. So I think that helped. Like people maybe thought it was a hundred percent. Yeah. People are always like, why, why do you like, Hey man, you're, you're posting the Lambo too much. Well, don't I yeah, gotta so, I gotta I play the game. Well, so yeah, so I'm sure you know by now, but yeah, I'm sure you've got haters too, and people wishing your family gets cancer and you mm-hmm. know, threatening and hoping you go to hell and all this stuff. Like that's fine, but it affected me and it still does to a certain degree. But yeah, once you get those people, like I've done that before, like stop talking about debt or stop talking about your 25 million in debt and all this stuff that I talk about. But that's like one person's opinion. Like I treat almost every video like it's going to reach a new audience. And I think that's part of the reason that I've been able to grow is because it's a lot of the same concepts, but not everybody sees every video you have. And as your audience grows and as you get new followers, they're going to, they're not going to have seen your video you posted two months ago. If you've got 20,000 followers in the last month, they didn't see that video. So again, I think so many people try to do so many different concepts that they just assume in their head that everybody sees their video. They don't. So that's why. So anyway, just saying the point of, yeah. If a couple people are saying you're doing limbo too much, tell them to sit and spin. So you're yeah, fine. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of entrepreneurs or just people in general, they want to they want to grow and scale on social media, but they're so worried about what people think of them, right? And at times I, I catch myself in this where I start looking at the comments and stuff like that and it ruins my day, whatever. Mm-hmm. How have you been able to to really push yourself? Because when you're getting a lot of views like that, there's going to be a lot of haters that come with it. Yeah, no, for sure. I think... It does, has affected me. It affects me less um, every time I see it, but it still kind of bums me out every once in a while when you see it just because it's somebody making a statement. I, I, and you do too, I'm sure I would literally get hundreds of positive comments and, you know, 30 DMs of just, Hey, love your stuff. Appreciate it. You're all, and then like the one that's like, Hey, you suck. You're a lie. Like, and it's not even true. Right. But so it does affect me to a little bit, but less and less over time. And if you just like take a step back, like Hermos talks about a lot, like if you have a problem, just like zoom out to the end of the universe and like all this stuff going on, like it's no big deal. So there's a little bit of that. I listen to Gary Vee a lot on his positivity and all that kind of stuff. And, but the the one thing I go back to, and I tell my daughter this all the time is hurt people, hurt people. So like, just put yourself in their shoes. If they're commenting or DMing, like somebody it's in my book, somebody, uh, DM'd me, I hope your family gets cancer for Christmas. And it's like, where is that person in their life? Yeah, you look you look at their profile. The the picture of their their profile picture is a picture of a cat and they got 13 followers and no posts. Yeah, and but, but yeah, exactly. That part of it too, but like where are they in their life mentally where they're wishing that upon somebody A, but then pulling out their phone and messaging it knowing another human's probably going to read it. So that's where 
it honestly is, and it sounds kind of corny, but it tur- sometimes it kind of almost turns into more empathy when I look at it from a, like empathetic like type point of view, like picturing myself doing that to somebody else, like how either drunk or high or like screwed up or sad I would have to be to do that. Like, I'm not going to get mad right. at that person. Yeah. So uh, Dave Ramsey gets a lot of hate up. Oh, yeah. he, he, he really does, you know, but he's killing the game and I, I'm sure he doesn't really care. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Dave Ramsey, he called you out on whatever social media platform, you know, what did you think of that when you saw that? And what did it do for, for your brand? Super exciting. I saw that I had actually somebody messaged me that when I was um, on vacation in Mexico, they're like, Dave Ramsey just called you a liar. I was like, what? And then he sent me the click. He's like, go to like the six minute mark or whatever it was where he's like that guy with the baby on his hip. And he went into like a tangent, like a three minute tangent, which was incredible. So it got me super excited because, um, I still do this, but uh, I still believe in this too, but yeah, never punch down, always punch up. And he's for sure punching down. Like my brand is decent, but it's like a grain of sand and on the beach compared to his brand. His mm-hmm. brand is ginormous. He's one of the biggest brands in the entire world. So for him to do that was just like super like kind of sketch ball on his part, but I loved it. I mean, he's punching down. So it allowed me to punch up and I could have been like, I, I was able to be a smart ass back because if he was like, I don't believe that dude had moved on. But the fact that he was kind of visceral about it uh, gave me a little bit of a runway to not look like I was trying to suck off his coattails. Like I'm just literally defending myself. You called me a liar in front of millions of people. So I got to defend myself. So it was great for, I think it, I, I mean, I didn't get like that videos that I've done, like responding to him. They've done well. You know, I think the, two, three, four hundred thousand, like a decent amount, you know, of views, but they haven't like gone viral. The videos responding to him. I've done like three or four of them. So not a ton. Uh, I think they probably helped the brand a little bit because it kind of made him look stupid. But uh, overall, it was just kind of cool because yeah, he's in a different stratosphere. So I'll, I'll take it all day. I actually, when the first time I met Pace Morby, you know, yeah, big, huge name. The first time I met him was a couple of weeks ago. And like, I, we were in like a room and he came over to me and I was going to introduce myself to him. He's like, he's like, fuck Dave Ramsey. He's like, he goes, all I want for Christmas is for Dave Ramsey to call me out on his show, you lucky bastard. So anyway, so it was, uh, it was, uh, it was interesting that, yeah, that's a, that was a pretty cool deal. What are some like social media influencers or people that you like really look up to or who are out there right now who are killing the game? I hate to be cliche, but gosh, darn it. Hermosi is like a, he's a, he's the goat. He's just, um. He's just so, and you're pretty good at it. I'm not. He's so articulate. He can tell a story and communicate so succinctly and like wrap a story in like a, in like a 45 second video. He can like tell a whole story about a brand and wrap it into with a cool ending. Like I can't do that. Most of my videos that do well, I don't talk in. I probably have 75 videos on social media that hit a million views and I'm probably talking in 20 of them. The rest of them are like music mm-hmm. playing, me pointing or just words popping up. So yeah, he's incredible, especially because he just got started, his communication skills and everything. So look up to him and just how he's done it. Gary V is just his positivity and his just beating the same drum. And honestly, Dave Ramsey, I not don't look up to his methods or his style and his demeaning attitude and his grumpiness that he seems to be um, garnering more of recently. But the brain he's built is impressive. Like people will like... I feel like if I went to like a bar somewhere that had his followers and said like screw Dave Ramsey, like someone would punch me. Like yeah, they might jump you. You might get in another bar fight. Yeah, I get into that's that (laughs) that, by the way, been in I was I joke about those, been in like five like actual fist fights in my life. Four of them I was defending Lucas, my business partner, by the way. He's the hot header was. One of them was with Lucas. So the common denominator is Lucas Walls, not me. So just want that on the record. Was he the shit talker at the oh, bar? Oh gosh, yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. Oh yeah. There is right, we don't need I could tell a yeah. story about a bar fight. We don't need to do that. We'll do that all. I'll time. I'll have to have him on here one of these days. I should have had both of you guys come you on. St- tell him just ask him about the Harpo's bar fight in Columbia. Just ask okay. him about that. All right. I will. I will. So I, I've been wanting you to, to ask you as well. We'll go back to the real estate a little bit. Mm-hmm. You said that you wholesale, you flip, right? You get rentals as well. What is going to determine if you're going to wholesale or flip or even make it a rental? How, yes. What's the deciding factor there? So the goal for, so we have six full-time acquisitions, guys. Their job is we give them marketing leads and their job is to go out and network with, they should have been networking with you and your company and buying from you, but with junk removal and real estate agents and other wholesalers. So that's, so six full-time guys. So I don't do like the day-to-day purchasing on houses anymore. I'll still get involved if we're buying an apartment complex or if we're doing like a, we bought 42 houses out here in Wentzville in one neighborhood. So if we do a bigger deal, I'll get involved in that or raising the money. But as far as like the day-to-day buying, we have full-time buyers to go out there and do it. And their job is to go solve the problem for the seller. And then two is buy the house. 
So their goal is to go solve the problem. We have plenty of places we go. We don't buy the house. We've had deals where we've told them to list it and not bought the house and they've referred us and we bought a house. So the goal is to solve their problem. Second goal is to buy the house. So that's what they're doing. And when they do that, their goal is to get it as low as reasonably possible. You know, we're, our margins aren't quite crazy in that business. So it's not like we're buying things for pennies on the dollar, but their goal is just get it at a deep enough discount that we can make a profit on it. So they bring it in and we look at it. Is it an area I want to own a rental? And is it going to cash flow at least 200 bucks a month after all expenses are paid? If that's the case, we'll keep it as a rental, but that's not the case as common these days with higher interest rates. And that's not the case in Chesterfield or Baldwin or town and country or, you know, certain areas or like Jennings, I don't want to own there. So if it, if it meets like the areas I want to own, and those are just areas of St. Louis for people that aren't from here, but if it's an area I want to own and it cash flows, we'll keep it as a rental. But if it's an area I don't want to own, We'll wholesale it probably. And if it's got a ton of equity, $400,000 house that cash flows, you know, that rents 2000 bucks a month, I know that's not going to cash flow. So then we'll just flip it. So it's kind of just the get a discount and figure out the best exit strategy. Right. Um, okay. Each deal. Yeah. And you have to evaluate that exit strategy, every exit strategy on each deal. Yep. And yeah, we got sys- we got like systems and, and kind of software built out to do that. But yeah. Are you trying to buy like very, very similar deals in terms of rentals? Like it's got to be a, a, f- you know, a three bed, two bath, this amount of square foot, and then all the finishes are going to be the same. Is that kind of what you guys are doing or? A little bit. Uh, we've, we've kind of tightened our buy box a little bit at first. It was kind of buying whatever, not wherever, but in general, kind of buy whatever, wherever everything's within about 30 minutes of our office, which is right there in O'Fallon. So that's kind of the, the area we want to be efficient with our maintenance, but we have two ones, we have three twos, we have three ones, we have four. So in general, just a, a simple, like nice house that someone's going to want to live in is the main thing. And, and we do make them pretty nice. We're, we're definitely landlords, not slumlords. We have, I, I we never were slumlords, but I remember at first kind of like just trying to like put paint on it and put it in and doesn't appraise for as much. You get, don't get as good tenants. It's hard to sell. People complain. Yeah. You don't get it. Yeah. It's hard to sell after the fact. You don't get as good tenants. You don't get as good rent. You go back for maintenance and that's super expensive. So we quickly learned, make it somewhere where someone wants to live, not has to live. It'll appraise for more. You'll have more equity. You'll get a better tenant. They'll pay more, less pain in the butt. You won't have to go back for maintenance one month, two months, three months in. So um, we've learned to make them a little bit nicer. So to answer your question, we kind of have general paint colors and flooring that we like to use just for efficiencies there. But other than that, as long as it's a good house in a good area and it cash flows, you know, there's not like an exact teeny little buy box. So the first flip that I was telling you about, mm-hmm. right, that we made 67000 on, after everyone went through, they painted, they did everything, I went through there. My, I actually had my mom go through there and mm-hmm. I, should, I shouldn't have done that. And she had a blue roll of tape, right? I love it. And it looked like, you know, it was, there was, dots all over the wall. And then I went to these contractors, she got me all fired up, right? And these contractors are like, oh, you're an investor, you know, like, we kind of did it cheaper for you. And you're we gave you that investor style, we didn't go like all out, you know, mm-hmm. for exactly what you were looking for. And there was like a lot of things that you know, were lipstick on a pig, we'll say, which I didn't really, it was my first deal, I didn't know that's exactly what I was getting. But I was picking, you pay for what you get. And I ended up making, it it was hard to sell at the beginning. And then I ended up finding a a great buyer that bought the property. And then he went back in there after our, after I already made 67,000 profit. And then he tore a wall down, put like this fancy green Island in there and changed the cabinets out and what we should have did. And he ended up selling it for a lot more than us. So if you would have done that, you would have made even more. Exactly. But that's a good. So you 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 made sixty seven grand or thirty three grand and learned a lesson. That's a that's a pretty good day though. Yep. Yep. So how many rentals do you guys have right now? And it sounds like you guys are buying uh, residential, commercial, that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, I think it's cool and not cool at the same time. So I don't know exactly. I it's like two hundred eighty five to two hundred ninety somewhere in there. I don't um, I don't you know know every house we buy. Uh, you know so to just put a little bit of perspective on it. So Lucas, you know, we were been buddies since middle school, but like we some days don't even see each other. So he kind of is CEO visionary for the flipping company and our rental portfolio, like management, we manage our own houses. So he kind of sees that he lives in that more world and I'm, you know, CEO visionary, whatever for the education company. So we have these three companies that we own, but we do kind of stay in our own lanes a little bit. So that's why I don't know exactly the rental amount, but it's around 285 to 290. And like you said, there's probably 150 houses in there, six apartment complexes, a few self storage facilities. And then we actually just bought 
like a like a boutique motel resort down in Branson, Missouri. Uh, that's that's going to be a pretty cool project. So yeah, we're kind of wanting to grow. If you want to own a billion in real estate, you got to buy a lot. But it's been really really cool, and especially being able to do it with properly leveraging debt, like I talked about earlier. None of my own money, so it, it's it's been fun. Are you trying to transition from buying single family homes to get into these bigger apartment complexes and that sort of thing? Um, a little bit, maybe. So our apartment complexes are pretty small. They're like nine, 12, uh, 19, 32, 27 and 29 units. Maybe I don't, I don't know if that's math's exact, but so they're smaller apartment complexes. So yes and no, like I know there's these people that buy these, you know, $50 million apartment complexes, they syndicate and they do that, everything and they own, they get paid a fee and they own 5% of it. Like that doesn't really excite me. I want to own a hundred percent of the assets that I have. And it's, I'm sure there's ways to do that with syndication, but that's more of like, you know, just partial ownership. So I think I could syndicate with social media. I think I could create a brand and some strategies and some videos around it and raise some money. And maybe we'll do that in the future. I might have to do that to buy the NBA team. But um, yeah, in general, I love single families. I mean, I'd love to own a thousand single family houses here in St. Louis. So I think we're going to continue to go down that path. We have the machine built with Faster House. We're bringing in 250, 300 a year. There's a chunk that will keep his rentals. But I do like the apartment complex game. It's more scalable. It's more efficient. The tax benefits are a little bit better with it. So um, I like both. I, I don't know that we'll ever go 100% all in on either one. I could see us buying bigger apartments or building them maybe or something like that. But uh, right now, the goal is just to kind of stick with the singles, the multis, and you know, occasional fun projects on the side. I heard you say that uh, you were planning on having a thousand employees. Like mm -hmm. that, that was the goal, right? Mm -hmm. Where where do you see all these people? Like what what do you see them doing? Is this going to be nationwide or in St. Louis? What what's kind of your plan there? Yeah, so we're going to figure that out. So we've kind of uh, figured out recently to just make crazy freaking goals. Like our goal was to own twenty five million in real estate by twenty twenty five. Or our first goal was to buy ten houses in ten years, so one house a year. Crush that. Our second goal is to buy 25 million real estate by 2025, and it's, you know, 2023, and we own 45. So we're just, uh, for lack of a better, we're crushing the goal. So let's make some big, you know, crazy goals. So that's kind of where the NBA team came. That's where the billion dollar organization came, as well as the billion dollars in real estate. Um, and we figured you need about a thousand employees at least to do that. So uh, I don't know where it's going to come from. It's an organization. Uh, it's not just going to be one company. And the crazy thing that I'm, I think I'm starting to realize is like the next big play for me, that's going to be a huge company might not even be anything that we've done yet or thought of. Like we're, we just started a company, Earlier this year, um, we had some internal things. We had to pull the guy away from it to do some accounting. But we're uh, invest loop is what we're calling it. We're going to invest in other companies and buy out companies. You know, there's I'm sure you know there's what 10,000 people turn 65 a day, and 18% of them own small businesses, and they're outdated in their marketing and technology. So there's going to be a ton of businesses for sale soon that you can get owner financing on. So, anyways, our goal is to buy businesses as well. That's an asset you can leverage money to buy businesses just like you can real estate. So I don't know exactly where it's going to come from. I just know uh, we like having a team. I don't try to get efficient and hire 20 VAs. We have, we like people in office and the culture and everything. So it's going to need, we're going to need a lot of team members and uh, we're excited to do that. They say real, real estate creates millionaires and private equity creates billionaires. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, you know, I see all these guys like Grant Cardone, Alex Hermosi, Ryan Pineda is now doing it. It sounds mm -hmm. like you're doing it now as well. You know, me going through the process of selling my company, I never went through anything like that. And what I learned was a lot of these people that were trying to acquire me were people who wanted to turn me into an owner operator, yeah. as well as get a, a deal that was too good to be true, just like, you know, real estate a little bit. Um, and then they were also trying to sell or finance the deals. And what, uh, what somebody told me that's in the industry said that majority of the businesses that go to market, probably that are small businesses, we'll say under a million a year, majority of those people will go to market and they don't, they don't end up selling the business for what they want. And they end up shutting the business down. And there's like, I'm pretty sure it's like over, it's probably over 40% that okay. number. Um, to where there's a lot of deals out there where people can, they want to start a business, they could go in and get a seller financing deal on a company that's already doing 300 grand a year than starting a junk removal company or any, anything else from scratch. Yeah, no, that's true. That's, yeah, it's got to be the right deal for us. And, you know, we're, you know, the goal is to buy something with an owner operator to a certain degree or somebody that you can bring in. We don't want to manage that company. We can infuse technology or marketing or things like that or infuse the brand to help it if that would help it. And, you know, the 
the goal is at least a million net. So, you know, there, there's not as many that do that, especially in the space. So we're just trying to, to find those companies and probably we kind of put that on pause. Like I said, probably next year we'll start to pick that back up. But yeah, that's the goal is to continue to build on these assets. And our, our question for you, are you, are you glad you sold your company? A hundred percent. Good. Okay. You know, it, yeah, I don't, I don't think twice about it whatsoever. Perfect. You know, it was a learning experience. Plus, I think a big thing that sometimes I kick myself in the butt for is like, I had this massive goal, right? Like I said earlier, of doing a hundred million a year in junk removal. And then I saw other avenues that people have taken, right? To where my goals and uh, that sort of thing have shifted to where now I'm choosing different vehicles that are going to get me to where I want to go quicker. Mm -hmm. And I know people who are a lot more successful than me, and they'll even have conversations with me kind of about what they're learning. And they're even asking themselves if they're in the right vehicle to get to a million mm -hmm. or a billion a year, you know? So yeah, I, I a hundred percent do, um, you know, I, I'm glad that I sold the business and I continue to want to buy and sell businesses as well. Yeah. So is that kind of where you're wanting to do businesses and real estate, a mixture of both or where are you going? Yeah, I would say I'm more of a bit, yeah, I'm a, more of a business guy than real estate just because that's kind of what I love doing. But mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I, I heard Eric Spofford, if you know him, he, the there was a video of him and it, it said, would you rather have a stack of money or a pile of money or a river of money? And when I, whenever I heard that, I was like, I got the stack of money, but mm -hmm. you know, you go by the the Lambo or whatever else, it's you know, it, it's gone. Yeah. So I I want that river of money, and also another thing is I was talking to some guy, and at this moment I was like, man, he he literally just went like this to me, and uh, he said, I was like, how many rentals do you have? And I expected him to be like, oh, I got like three or four, and he was like, I got sixty five, and I would consider myself a lot more high level than this person, right? Mm -hmm. How many you got? I was like, oh, I got zero. And I was like, why do, why do I have zero? I got to go get some more rentals. <laughs> yeah. So, and as well as tax advantages, mm -hmm. I would say that's the biggest thing. So I'll probably do a combination of both business being uh, the bigger one and mm -hmm. really focus on uh, buying and selling businesses. Yeah, I think that's smart. I think a mixture of both and do what you're passionate about for sure. And if it's more business, but yeah, a mixture of both, that's, you'll figure it out. You're, you're, uh, uh, doing really well for a 23 year old. I appreciate it. Not as well as you, but I'll get there. You'll get there. You're, I'm, I'm 35. So you got some years. I always tell people that play that comparison game. It's like, you can't compare your chapter three to my chapter nine. It's not even like you would never do that in anything. So yeah. So you have this education company, right? Faster Freedom. Mm -hmm. You got this big office in O'Fallon. Um, do your students, are they coming out to your office or what What are they kind of getting a part of that, the Faster Freedom package? Yeah. So for the being the community, some of them do come out to like our, our local meetup that we talk about, but it's it's all uh, virtual. We have students in all 50 states, uh, every city, pretty much the decent sized city. And they get, you know, weekly group coaching calls, weekly one-on-one -on -one calls with coaches. Some of the coaches are prior students that have done really well. They each have 40 rentals. The other two coaches, Luke's and I occasionally take calls. They get a Facebook group of, you know, 1,400 people in there that um, respond and, and help you answer. So you basically, you know, you get right now you get, you know, a, you know, 10 weekly group coaching calls. You can attend any of them. You get one-on-one -on -one call slots if you need them. You have the Facebook group, you have the community, and then you have about 400 videos that I recorded over like eight months that walk you through the step. So if you don't want to talk to somebody, you just want to learn, you have that option. If you just want to learn and ask questions in, in group coaching calls, you can. If you want some one-on-one -on -one slots available, and then you have the Facebook group to bounce off. So I kind of took a lot of the people we've mentioned and people think of, I kind of took what they did in their communities and just did it, blended it all in one and feel like, you know, what we're selling it for, you know, 10% of what it's worth. So it's kind of like a no brainer for a lot of people to get involved in. So yeah, it's just building a community. And I feel like we're going to continue to make it better. Uh, every single day, every single quarter, we're adding new modules and doing new things. So the goal is it to, you know, to have people just ranting and raving and changing people's lives for being involved and being around uh, like minded people. Mark Cuban made a video recently, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And he was basically talking shit about uh, people who are selling information of what they've done. He says that, you know, they're basically bullshitting you if they're they're selling this stuff, because why wouldn't they go do it themselves? What what, what would you say your answer is to that? Well, I, so part, part, I partially agree with that. I think with technology and AI, like information is going to be completely devalued. You're going to be able to get information anywhere. You'll be able to look it up, get AI technology and answer any question like that. So that's where like the community, you cannot replicate implementation. You cannot replicate a coach talking to you through a deal and giving you the certain scenarios and, and you can't 
replicate that community feel and that being around other people and being pushed and driven and, you know, looking up to somebody and trying to chase what they're doing. So that stuff and that like the real stuff that makes the difference, you can't replicate. You you only learn 20 percent from reading or information like Mark says. The other 80 percent is implementation and doing it in your business and any business. Right. You learned everything by doing it. So that's where our sweet spot is. We are that 80 percent. We're going to help you implement and walk you through it. And. I, I mean, Mark's super smart. Everybody has their different opinions. And, and I get some of that hate of like, if you were doing so well in real estate, you wouldn't be coaching it. But why can't I do both? Elon Musk works 80 hours a week. You think he needs the money, right? Like some people have bigger aspirations than money. Like my I'm like, obviously nowhere near those guys level, but it's not really, it's about the money. I'm not going to lie, but it's more about the impact. Like the money is there. I could stop working now and live an okay life like I, but I want to obviously do more and buy more and do more cool stuff and impact more people and give more money to charity and all those fun things. But it's more about the impact uh, now than the money. And I feel like as soon as I made that shift, like I, I was like, we got great culture. I'm about mindset of abundance, right? Like I said that for the longest time. And then about 18 months, two years ago, maybe I don't know what it was, but I feel like it really started to click. That really became true, like inside, not just outside. And the minute that happened, it was really weird. Then I started to make more money than I knew what to do with. Right before, it's like chasing the money, chasing the money. You're doing things. I was always ethical, integrity, everything. But when you're chasing that, just you just get tunnel vision and your vision's clouded. But when you step back and truly like, all right, you take the deal or I don't need to make this much money or you want to refund even though you didn't watch one video. Okay, like I'm not worried about like every single dollar and you just take a step back and you're more bigger picture focus and really trying to provide solutions and provide impact starts to take traction then like the money just like dumps in like that river or that that waterfall of money so it's it it's hard to get to that point and truly trust that that's going to happen but that's what's happened in the successful people that I know as lives and that's really what's happened happened in my life I've had two conversations with billionaires and their mindset and their uh you know how they view money and how they view the world is like light years of compared to where I was when I thought I had a pretty mm -hmm. good mindset so I think that it all kind of plays together and people could always go spend $50,000 and go get educated at college or whatever and learn about a little bit about everything and then go and get that job where they're making, you know, 50,000 a year, maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year. But there's really not a whole lot of potential for a big percentage of people, you know, doing that. So you are, you know, you already said it, there was a teacher that literally went through your program, bought all these rentals. And now he's teaching the school. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. That's, that's crazy. Yeah, no, there's, so that's the cool thing. So the, 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 the coaching program, the community, the mentorship, whatever you want to call it, it's a little less than two years old. And we have 1400 students, um, mentees, whatever you want to call it. And I've, now that it's been around long enough, it's hard six months in to be like, we're changing lives kind of hard a year in to be like, we're changing lives because it takes people taking action, getting approved. Like it's, I'm not teaching people how to build widgets. I'm teaching them how to build wealth without using any of their own money, financial freedom, real estate. Like it's, it's a complex topic that requires a relationship of me providing value and them going, taking action. That's not for everybody. So at first I knew we were providing value, but wasn't making an impact. And now we have the examples of, you know, there's $200 million of real estate owned inside that mentorship between the coaches and the students. And there's, you know, I wouldn't say daily, but at least weekly, there's people posting, I bought my first rental property. I bought my, like people getting wins. So it's really cool to see that impact. Like, and then there's also students that never log in and never do a thing. Right. So it's, it's, but it's cool to see that it's actually impactful. And that gets me even more excited about, and that makes me want to focus even more time on making it better. I'm actually curious about that because obviously we're, we're in a very similar industry and, uh, you know, for the amount of people that I've brought through the program, for example, and uh, we use ClickFunnels, you can go through and see exactly when somebody clicks something and, mm -hmm. you know, the percentage that they've had completed. What would you say is the average completion rate, if you want to put that number out there? Oh, no, I can. Yeah, um, I can. So it'd be it'd be a pretty wild guess, but I can probably get so that that's just one portion of it. Um, you know, it's the 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 calls or the the videos. I would say about I would say about a quarter of the people don't even watch the videos. They just attend the calls, which is more powerful anyway. Mm -hmm. But I would say, tell me your number. I would probably say how many people completed or how many people watch videos. Like the per the percentage of completion rate, a hundred a oh, hundred being oh, fully completed. Oh. 5% or less. I mean, there's 350 videos as part of it, but let's just say half that watch half the videos. I'd say there's probably 10 or 15% that watch half the videos. What about, what is your rate? So 
I don't have 350 oh. videos. And I've also I've also taken a course where there's like overwhelming amount of information. I'm probably one of those 5% people. But uh, I would say on average, probably 30%. Okay. You know, How many and, and are there? uh, there's, there's probably like near a hundred, okay, I would so say a lot. like you can, yeah, you can complete, you can com well, sorry, there's actually, there's been a hundred hours worth of calls that are like pre-recorded. So okay. we'll put our coaching calls on there as well. But, um, I assume that people aren't going, you know, through every single one of those calls because there's so much information. So we probably do have you know, 200 calls, but I'm going to say 30% is what ClickFunnels at least shows me. And in terms of the coaching calls, I would say 5% of people actually show up to the coaching calls. What I learned, what I realized is like, I thought that majority of my value was going to be put on the coaching calls, which it is, right? Because that's when I can ask you unique questions that you didn't think of, right? Because every situation is different to put on a course where I can show up and actually talk to people and listen to the other people who are in the group getting their first deal. And it makes me motivated, right? Where a lot of people come in at, uh, with my experience and they think all the value is going to be on that course. And that's all they want to look at. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to show up to any calls. Yeah, no, that's, it's just uncomfortable. It's easy to sit in on your couch or in your bed and throw in your AirPods and watch videos like that's super easy. It takes another level of commitment to show up to the call. So yeah, I mean, that makes sense. But as you just said, the value, I feel like the value is on those calls. Like I always tell people like you're in a group coaching call of 20, 25 people. I would say the average call is probably 25 people. Um, we have multiple a week, but like somebody's going to ask a question that you don't even know to ask. Like there was just a perfect example, like six months ago, somebody asked about a bank and I mentioned a legal lending limit and like everybody was like, there was like 40 people like, hold on, the banks have legal lending limits. I was like, yes, these small local banks, they have a legal amount of money they can lend you based on their books, based on their cash position, based on a lot of different things. That's a formula and granted, most small banks are 15 to 20 million of loans. So you got a lot of runway, but just that type of situation of somebody that's slightly ahead of you were way ahead of you asking a question you didn't even know to ask or you asking people questions that they don't know to ask that that's where the magic happens is those calls so yeah i, I feel like if i got rid of the videos we'd still sell almost as many as we right, sold right what uh wh what's your plan with social media from here what like you already have 2.7 million followers what's what do you think is going to get you to 5 million or 10 million what's your plan moving forward i don't know so it's social media is such a, f a fickle to use the better f word just beast it's crazy um you know, there's just so many ups and downs in the algorithm and everything. I just got off a hot streak and now we're down in a cold streak right now. It was the videos were all doing crazy there for a while. I don't know. I struggle because I see people that have grown a social media following because they created the brand. They shot the videos on their phone. They edited in the app or in CapCut or did whatever. And they got a following. And then for whatever reason, they refocused their time. They felt like they were like big and bad and got, you know, a little vain or whatever it is. And then they hand that off to a third party company and then they just completely go stagnant or their, their, you know, their followers fall off or they just lose momentum because they built the brand around them and their personality. So I struggle with that because I could get more content out if I completely was hands off and was like, Hey, you come up with the topics, I'll shoot them. I'll be in them. You add them, you do everything. And I feel like, and I've, I've, I played with that. I, we do, I, I do some still, and I have a team that helps me a little bit, but I don't want to lose that edge and the reason why people follow me. So I struggle with that. I don't want to be, I probably spend 20, 25 hours a week on social media. I don't want to be doing that forever, but right now uh, it's probably the best play. And it's the reason I feel like I continue to grow is because I haven't, I feel like probably most people that had over 2 million followers don't like do anything with social media anymore, right? They're doing other stuff. So yeah. the fact that I'm so actively involved is the reason I think I'm continuing to grow. So I don't really, no, I wish I knew. All I know is I'm going to continue to do it. I like the idea of having eyeballs. Like I have a, you know, I drink, do you drink Celsius, the low energy drink a little bit? I, I'm more of a, I like something with a little more kick, but okay. I used to drink them. Okay. So, so, yeah. so like, like having, so the reason I spend the time on it and it's not that immediate ROI, cause I have 2.7 million followers and 1400 uh, students. So there's, you know, there's a big gap there, right? The reason I continue to do it because I believe in the eyeballs and the brand. So like if I thought it'd be awesome to launch an energy drink, like, you know, I know, I think one of the Paul brothers did it with Prime or whatever. Yeah. So, and Jake he's going, Paul and he, his interviews, he's like, he's this. going through some, 
some, I think, legal battles right now with a few other things with some of the ingredients and advertising to kids oh, and all this Logan stuff. Logan Paul. Yeah. Prime. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, he's going with some of that. So, anyway, so, like, that would be much easier to do in two years if it's the right brand, it's done right or whatever, and everything's on the up and up if I have four million followers. So, like, the, I th feel like the next brands that I build, having an audience will just help. So, that's why I continue to do it. I don't know what's going to get me to the next level. I definitely, uh, just like I said, got off a hot streak. I think I had uh, in August, I had like, I think we just ran the numbers about 16 million views for free on social media, right? Everything was hitting, everything was popping. I was doing stuff. It was like the algorithms for some reason, they all kind of caught whatever it was or the content, whatever the mixture was. And now we're kind of going back down to earth. So anyways, I'm going to continue to be frust frustratingly involved for a little while at least. You know, what What makes me like take social media so serious is I remember back in high school, some some kid, Which wasn't that long ago. Right, yeah, yeah. I'm reminded that all the time by mm -hmm. my girlfriend mm -hmm. who's 27. Okay, I thought you were going to say she was in high school. Just no, kidding. no. <laughs> just graduated. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. So I remember this kid. I wasn't like great friends with him or anything, but he was like, yeah, I'm going to start posting on this new app called TikTok. And I'm like, yeah, right. And he was talking about how he was just going to pop off because nobody was on the platform. And I was like thinking in my head, yeah, right. I didn't get TikTok for the longest time. It might have been last year when I got TikTok, honestly. He never ended up doing anything, but that's when I first thought about it. And now I'm like, man, if I started at that point, yeah. I'd have millions of followers mm -hmm. right now. It would have been so much easier. So all these people who watch content, they're like, yeah, I plan on doing it. I plan on doing it in the future, right? I have, I've got to do one more deal to make sure that I hit this X amount and then I'm going to be credible enough to post content where it scares me every single day that the algorithm is going to change to where it's so hard to grow. And I, I just don't want to don't want to risk that. And also Pineda, when I went to his podcast, I saw the studio that he had all of the equipment and I was just like, man, that's like he was really taking it serious for mm -hmm. sure. So do you have like a media team or anything like that? We do. Yeah. So no, taking it. Yeah. I, I agree with a lot of what you said there, uh, you know, getting involved now. And, and I wanted to piggyback off one thing Then we'll talk about my team is people get fearful, like they haven't done enough deals to post or they like need that credibility. And that is like the opposite of what you love, what they should be doing. Like I always tell the story of, um, I don't know if you're, if you don't follow social media much, you might not know her. Lily Thompson's her name. She's got like 200 some thousand on, on YouTube, which is the obvious, you know, pretty much the hardest one to grow. But I remember, and I have like 92,000 on YouTube or something like that. And I don't even, I stopped posting on that channel. Actually, I, I quit that, that channel of YouTube. But anyways, I remember at the time I had like 60,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube and she had like 150,000 and she hadn't even done her first deal yet. Like, and I had 200 rentals at the time or whatever. So people, it's almost better to talk through, hey, I'm trying to get my first deal. Whether we're we'll just talking real estate because that's simple, but I'm trying to get my first deal. This whole wholesaler said, no, I'm trying to raise, like your journey and having the audience go with you because that's where they are. Nobody can relate or not nobody, but very few people can relate to my $46 million worth of real estate problems that come arise. They can relate to that person who's done two deals or trying to get their first or second one. So I would just tell anybody that's thinking about to do it now and document your journey, you will get followers faster than than a lot of what I've been able to do. So anyways, there's that. And then yeah, I have a pretty small team. I have so I have uh, one editor in house, another editor outsourced. And then I have like a like kind of a brain manager because um, Ryan's a perfect example. I know Ryan uh, was in a mastermind with him text him every once in a while. I'm going on his podcast uh, next week or in a couple weeks. And he has a bigger brand than I do, but I have like probably 500,000 more followers than him. So it's not just about eyeballs. So I, anyways, I say that I hired a brand manager to help me like grow a brand, do some PR stuff. So he's in house helping me like come up with a brand strategy to grow the faster freedom, the same print brand, whatever you want to call it. Cause Ryan's a perfect example. His brand is not twice as big, but his brand is bigger than my brand for sure. But I have way more followers than him. Cause it's not just about followers. So I, that's like what I've focused on for the last year is just followers and that doesn't always convert to money. It uh, doesn't always convert to a big brand. So now I'm trying to, you know, work on that community like we talked about a little bit earlier, make that better, and then um, work on the brand a little bit more. That's amazing, man. So uh, what, what's your what's your plan from here? Like, where where are you going to take things? Obviously, I know you want to buy some teams and stuff like that. But what what are some like really key things that that you're trying to accomplish in the in the near future? Okay, Let, let's take a big picture, then zero it down. So okay. that so the NBA comment. So. I don't think I'm ever, I mean, I might own an NBA team. That's not the, the goal. The the goal is, like you said, there's the the measurables and, and 
to own an NBA team in St. Louis, which is not the most desirable city for NBA, I would guess, um, it would just have to check a lot of boxes. It's like a measurable to check boxes. It would mean I'd made a lot of money, networked with other multimillionaires and billionaires, made strides in the community, made the community better, will bring employment to St. Louis. It would just like, I'm going to always be here. Like I'll have vacation houses and jets and all that fun stuff, but I'm always going to be home base here. So that, that, that's a cool goal and it's fun to say, but it's more of like, if I did that, all the boxes that would be checked of the income and the, the, the impact and the community and everything that I've done and the networking that I will have to do in the local government that I'll have to be in, you know, in, you know, in tune with and everything. So that's that, but taking a step back, um, so what we do is we take a five-year plan and then we put a plan out there. So in, two, in 2021, I said by 2026, end of 2026, I want to have the uh, top five real estate investing education brand in the country. Top five in the country, like, you know, the rich dad, poor dad, the wealth builders, all the Thane Merrills, all those, those, huge, those huge brands, I want to be top five. And then that's my five-year plan. Like, I don't know how I'm going to get there. That's literally, that's all it is, is one sentence on our sheet on our traction organizer. And then three years was like, I need to have this, this, this in place. And then we break down the one year. So um, the goal is to just continue to just take it one year at a time, one quarter at a time, one week at a time. So to just distill everything down, have big goals, but then have actionable, pla actionable plans to get there. So we don't really have a huge plan to get there exactly. The, the plan is to continue to grow, um, grow the social media stuff for sure, grow the brand, keep continuing to do education. I think uh, for a while there, I was wanting to pull away from education, pull away from social media. It's just a lot um, and focus maybe more on flipping or renting. But I feel like the biggest bang for my buck and the best use of my time is continuing to grow this brand, which obviously you believe in doing all this stuff. So my focus is 80% still going to be on social media, growing a brand and uh, impacting more people and hopefully getting more people involved in the community. A hundred percent, man. I saw that you just uh, launched your book, which mm -hmm. I think the video that you created, I watched, it was hilarious. With with the, yeah, with I just did one with Dave Ramsey. I got his book and me inside of it. So that's coming okay. out today. That's, that's great. Okay. So where can everybody find your book and what, what are they going to learn in this book? Yeah, it's just on Amazon. So it's, uh, it's, you can go to Amazon. It's called own your freedom. So type in own your freedom or Sam Prim. It'll be on there. It's five bucks. So it's, you know, it, it funny story. It took me about 18 months to write it. I hired a, I paid like seven, eight grand for a ghost writer to write it with me. Like we met weekly for like eight months and wrote it. And, and so I was like, I was a part of it, but it wasn't my, me typing and writing it. And then I got the finished product and it was just crap. It, it sounded like crap. It didn't sound like me. So I fired them and did it myself. So I took that framework and retyped it all, used chat GPT a little bit, all that kind of stuff, but I wrote it. So it took me about another year to write it. So um, it just goes through my journey of own your freedom is what it's called. It's about owning your future and doing what I did. Just kind of tells my story through everything I've done, the lessons I've learned. We get into social media a little bit. So it's just it's like 110 pages. It's a quick read. It's five bucks on Amazon. I think I make like a buck 50 every book you buy. And then the ebook's 99 cents. So um, yeah, it's just kind of a, a peek behind the curtains of what I've done. Definitely not an author, but I've had a few people really liked it. It was is number one seller in the real estate for a while. It sold over a thousand copies, which is pretty cool for, you know, no advertising. And that's the part of having a brain and eyeballs, right? I push it a few times and created two or three videos on it. So nothing crazy. So that's one of the, the cool things about having a brain and eyeballs. You can point them in the direction of a book. So if you're interested and uh, I promise you it's worth five bucks, uh, like I think in the video, I'm like, it's probably not as good as Hermosi's books, but for five bucks, it's probably worth right, it. So right. might as well. Uh, there's no risk there. What's some of the, before we wrap up here, what's some of the best advice that you could give somebody who is trying to replicate your success, whether it's social media or even real estate? So, yeah, the first thing I would say is, um, it's tough. I get it. But, and we talked about Ryan, so it was on top of my mind is I remember talking to Ryan and he's like, I have people that are in my creator deal and people are like, I've made videos just like you and they don't hit. And he's like, well, stop. You're not me. Make videos different. So trying to replicate it, just that word pop my, trying to replicate would be what I would say not to do. You know, don't try to replicate my style. I've tried other styles. They don't work. So just post and, and, you know, put your style out there. You'll figure out your style as you go. But the biggest uh, couple of things I can tell people is number one would be um, if you avoid failure, you are literally avoiding success. They're on the same path. Like you're not going to be successful unless you fail. Like there is no path that, that that you will go on, you or anybody listening that will lead to success that doesn't have failure involved. So if you're trying to avoid failure, you, you will not get where you want to go. I hate people that speak in absolutes, but that's an absolute truth. If you avoid failure, you avoid success. So just understand that and be okay with failure. And then the other thing I would say to make this super corny would be, um, 
the most successful people I know just, it's so simple, but they just, they don't give up after they do fail. Like, it's not like they're super smart or have a leg up or higher education or rich parents. It's just that they don't give up. So many people try something, they screw up, they fail, and then they just don't get up. If, if you don't give up and you get up, you will 100% reach your goal. It might be a year later than you want or two years later than you want, but if you don't give up, you can literally do anything. It just takes a lot of discipline to not give up. So I 100% agree. Ones. That's a, that's an amazing vice. Where can where can everybody find you or get a hold of you? Yeah, so I'm pretty much on all the social medias that you mentioned. I would say whatever social media you're on, just shoot me a follow. We'd look up Sam Prim or Sam Faster Freedom. And as you have seen, I'm sure there's a lot of fake accounts everywhere. Make sure to swim with the blue mm. check mark that you're following because there's a lot of scammers that will try and take your crypto. So just whatever social media platform is, follow me. You can shoot me a DM. I still answer them. I probably shouldn't. Um, I have some like automatic responders. If you type in the word lender, it'll send you something. But in general, if it's a message, it's from me. So just look me up. If you're not on X, don't don't go start an X account to follow me. That's bad for my stuff. Like they, mm -hmm. the algorithms want people that are active. So whatever you're on, follow me. The one I'm most active on is Instagram. That's what I've been focused on this year. I've had the most growth there for sure. That's what I focused on is Instagram. So I, that's just the best stories. I can show my personal life. We can message. I can show longer videos. It's got the real. So anyways, Instagram is my favorite right now. But whatever platform you're on, just follow me and uh, shoot me a message and go buy the book. Own your buy freedom. The book. Five bucks. It's worth five bucks. It is. It's. It's probably not worth 10 bucks, but it's worth five. <laughs> well, uh, I really appreciate you coming on, man, and uh, look forward to connecting more since we're, you know, this is our first time meeting. You yeah, know, we're so. local. You'll be, you'll be on my podcast next. Okay, you got it. You got it. All right, we'll see you guys in the next one.